So this is uh, device agnostic development. And I'm Paul Lewis. I'm the guy looking confused over on the left. And uh, well, I'm actually on the right right now. Um, I spend, I'm on the Chrome developer relations team. And I spend most of my days uh, talking about and looking at rendering performance. I'm Peter Beverloo. I'm a software engineer in the Chrome team. I work on Chrome for Android. And I mostly spend my time pushing the web platform forward. So we ran a small survey. And we asked developers uh, two questions, uh, amongst many. And the questions we asked them were, which form factors do you support versus prioritize? And as you can see, perhaps not surprisingly, 96% of people said, you know what, we support desktop, uh, which is pretty much everybody. And 2 thirds of people went for phone and tablet. But as you can see on the prioritization side, 81% of the, the 200 or so developers that we asked said, you know what, desktop is our top priority. OK, so just take that in. Four out of five developers are just going to focus pretty much on the desktop. Now, this leads us to a question. If we prioritize a single form factor, what happens? Well, the answer is probably quite obvious, right? We, we start to uh, build on the expectations of capability. We build expecting that we, we're going to have desktop-like performance, that we're going to expect to see Big screens, good GPUs, good CPUs, a lot of memory, all those kinds of things. So along comes a new form factor, such as mobile. What does this mean? Well, we've been creating websites for desktop experiences for quite a long time now. And desktop experiences give us a number of, of advantages over, different, uh, over more limited platforms, such as mobile devices. As an example, there, there's this big screen available to you which has a lot of space for you to, to put content on or to put data on. But on mobile, this is different. And it's not just the screen size which is different. It's a lot smaller. But it's also in terms of a number of additional constraints, such as computational power. We create websites uh, using a lot of JavaScript, for example, for scrolling or for accordions. And while this works fine and acceptable on a desktop machine, on a mobile, this, this will just look janky. So along comes a new form factor. But what? It's not just about desktop and mobile. The web actually goes quite a bit further than that. And this is something we've only started to see quite recently. Back in the days, um, there used to be mobile devices which were capable of internet using iMode or similar systems. But they weren't really internet. They, you could see a web page. You could talk to a server. But the experience was quite limited. These days, mobile devices, such as phones and tablets, they're basically on par with desktop devices. And they just work, just like a desktop machine. Of course, with a number of additional constraints. Now, we're going to see more and more websites coming to televisions or to consoles. On a television, the screen is a lot bigger. But we also know that the user is sitting away from the screen quite a bit further than is the case with a mo mobile device or a desktop machine which means that as developers, we actually have to change how we create that website. With console, be it a portable one or be it a stationary one next to your television, it, the story change, uh, changes completely altogether again. And with portable, device, uh, portable devices such as consoles, they, they can be similar to mobile, like a telephone. But they could be entirely different as well with different forms of inputs and different types of managing your data which come with it. And we really don't know. Like, what is the next device? We've got desktops, mobile, televisions, consoles. But what's going to come next? Are it going to be wearable computers? Could be anything. So the point that we're trying to make with all this is that it's just the web. Okay? We, we have this propensity for talking about the mobile web. We don't talk about the desktop web, though. We don't talk about the TV web or the console web. We just talk about the mobile web. And that's fair enough to some degree. But what we need to start realizing, I think, is that it's just the web. It's consumed through a number of different devices. And a good experience matters no matter what the device. So then, becoming device agnostic. If we figure that we, we're going to have people connecting to our sites and applications through a bunch of different devices, how can we start actually being device agnostic? So the grand unified theory of devices. Sounds good. Um, we figured we can actually turn this on its head. 
we can actually start figuring out what the constraints are. Okay? Instead of device capability, what about, what about looking at the device constraint? And we figured there are actually these three constraints. And we can assess every device that we know about today and the ones that we don't know about today, the ones that are coming tomorrow, in the same way. Network, how quickly can it pull stuff down on the wire? What's the latency? What's the bandwidth? If it's, if it's network constrained, it's going to be slow. Compute constraint, so how quickly can it process information? How much memory has it got? Is it good at calculating my styles, laying out my page? What's the CPU like? Okay. And then the last one is a giant, shiny monkey head. Or it's about rendering. It's about pixels. How quickly can it push pixel, pixels around the screen? Does it have a good GPU? And when we start actually looking at, uh, at it from this perspective, what we can actually start to realize is if we distance ourselves from these constraints, and if we start planning for these constraints, then what we, we, we realize is that we are, in effect, becoming agnostic to them, so that when we hit a device with one or more of these constraints, that we're not actually as bothered by it. So instead of relying on the capabilities of a desktop, we're now going to sp spin it on its head. We're going to look at these constraints in turn, figure out what comes up and how we can distance ourselves from them. So let's look at a few of these device types and map them against the constraints. And this creates quite an interesting matrix. Um, I apologize for those of you in the back. It will be extremely hard to read, so I'll just name what's on the slides. On a desktop machine, the network will generally be quite good. You'll be connected to your home DSL connection, which will be, which will be quite performant. Computational power will be, uh, will be decent, even for older desktop machines. Well, they're still better than mobile. Rendering performance will be decent because they're multi-purpose machines and they're not just created for a single, for like streaming video. So they, they'll be able to display a website. And the screen is big. Maybe not as big as a television inside in terms of physical size, but often you have a monitor of maybe 20 or 24 inches attached to it. And as a developer, that gives you a lot of space to play with. On mobile, it's a little bit different. With a mobile device, you can, on a, you can be on the move at any random time and you cannot rely on a network connection to always be available. So the con network conditions are quite bad. Computational power can be okay. There's different classes of mobile devices. Tablets are, of course, entirely different from phones. But even within a, a single class, such as a phone, there can be quite a lot of differences. We've got phones um, of over five, six hundred dollars. There's phones of fifty dollars, and computa computational power will rely a lot on the capabilities of the actual device. Rendering performance will be bad. Um, we're trying to get to 60 frames per second, but it turns out to be really difficult to get there on any platform. And the screen is quite small. That's the physical screen size, while the actual uh, logical screen size, so the number of pixels which have to be shown to the user, can be a lot bigger because we've got all these awesome high-resolution phones. For televisions, well, they're standing, they're standing in your house. I don't often walk around with a television behind my arm. What? I do. <laughs> no, no. OK. So the network conditions will generally be similar to your normal desktop computer. Computational power is bad. It's mean for showing video, not for showing a website. Rendering performance will be bad for the same reasons, because the device really has been made for a single purpose. And the screen is pretty big, but the resolution can be smaller, and in some cases even smaller than a mobile device. Now, for consoles, it's quite similar to mobile. Um, it depends on the kind of console, really. You can be on a move at all times. Computational power, well, they're meant for games, for interactive for interactive imaging, while websites can be static content. Rendering performance, it, it, again, it really depends on the device. And the same goes for the screen size. And for the new class of devices, we just don't know. We have no idea what's coming to get us. Actually, to be fair, if we just take a step back, we actually don't know on any of these. Because let's say desktop. Take that for a second. It could be a laptop as well. Now, we said good under network, but what if you've tethered your phone? Or what if you have a dial-up internet connection? Yeah. At this point, it actually all bets are off, right? Because on pretty much any of these, you can find an exception. OK? So the sad reality is that everything in this matrix is a maybe. We just don't know. 
And the only real way to figure out what you need to optimize for in your website is not to just blindly apply all the best practices you can find around the internet. You need to measure and you need to look at your statistics. Go to whatever statistics you have, look at the devices which your visitors are actually using, optimize for these devices. Use a number of available APIs, which we'll come back to later in this presentation, and actually measure where your performance bottlenecks are. So one way of actually measuring what's going on are the Chrome DevTools. This is built into Google Chrome in all the release channels, and it's, it makes it entirely possible to, to accurately measure any aspect of what's, well, at any time what's happening on your page in terms of network computational requirements and rendering as well. We've got a series of videos available on YouTube. They're called the Breakpoint. Um, the screenshot here is showing Paul Iris, um on the first on the first few seconds of a presentation, which gives you um, a video introduction to a number of the features available in DevTools. There was a talk yesterday, yesterday about the Chrome DevTools revolution, which will have shown you about a number of new features which have recently become available. And we've recently updated the DevTools documentation, which you can definitely check out as well, and which contains a lot of information about how to measure exactly what's going on on your pages. Okay, so we've established that we, um, we could be on any device and we can't really predict exactly uh, what the constraints are going to be for that device. So now let's step into network compute and render. And this is actually essentially a, a performance talk by the back door. If you've been up to uh, the third floor and seen in the Chrome area, we actually have a performance area. And network compute and render are, in fact, those three areas. So if you've not been, you should stop by. But what we're going to do is we're going to step through the common issues that we see on each of these three areas. And we're going to try and find ways of distancing ourselves from those constraints so that irrespective of which device we're actually hitting, if we hit that constraint, we've done everything that we possibly can to try and make that a non-issue. So the first thing to keep in mind is the page load time. This basically describes the time it takes for the user to start a navigation action, like clicking on a link or entering a link in their browser address bar, until the time that, they're, that they see the page and that they're actually able to use it. Now, you've got all your visitors. If your page on a mobile device takes more than three seconds to load, then 57% of your visitors will go away. They'll just leave. They'll go elsewhere. They might, they might search for an alternative. They may know an alternative. And they're gone for the day, basically. Now it gets worse. From all these visitors, if your page takes more than three seconds to load, 46% will not return. They'll find, they fi they'll find a competitor of yours. They'll find an alternative source of the data of the information which you're giving to them. And they'll start preferring that other website just because it loads a little bit faster. And probably the worst statistic is that 22% of your visitors will tell their friends to not use your website. Now let that sink in for a little bit. That means that over one in five visitors of your mobile website will tell their friends to not visit your site if your page takes more than three seconds to load. That's quite a lot of impact. And one thing to keep in mind here is that the perceived loading time of a web page is actually 15% higher than the actual loading time. And it gets worse, because when they're talking to their friends about this, they will remember a loading time which is up to 35% slower of what it actually was. So while it actually could have been three seconds, in their memory, it may very well be up to five seconds or more. So there's a few things we can do. And probably the biggest contributor to having a big load, um, a big load time for your web pages is having a huge number of requests on your page. Now, there's, for every request to your page, we can look at the costs um, implied by it, and we can split it up in three different ones. Firstly, there's the latency cost. For each of these requests, for the resources, which could be an image or a style sheet, we need to make a connection to the server, or may, well, in some cases, because in other cases, we might be able to reuse the connection. We need to request the resource, get a reply, and that could take a little bit of time, especially if the resource is hosted on a different server, in, case, uh, in which case a DNS lookup might be necessary. Now, for big resources such as images, bandwidth might be a constraint. If, if I'm on a 3G connection and I'm sitting on a train, then 
it will it will get well it will take a while for that image to be available on my uh, on my mobile device and of course there's a financial cost this is not just about visitors which you may lose if your site takes quite a long time to load but Paul and I are from the United Kingdom and if we want to use the mobile internet on our normal phones here in the United States, then that costs us up to $8 per megabyte. Now, you need to have a really good service or website if I want to use it at that cost. So probably the easiest thing to do here is obsolete a number of these requests. For every single one of, your, of the resources on your page, ask yourself, do you really need it? Can you maybe get around by, by inlining it on the page? by concatenating style sheets, so having several style sheets in a single file, or can you perhaps minify them to reduce the bandwidth cost? And making optimizations such as these will often show to have a big impact in the base loading time performance of your websites. Now, a lot of people already do this one, right? Most people, when you speak to them, they say, yeah, we, we, we concatenate and minify our files. The next thing that we want to talk about is um, reducing the image overhead. A statistic that you may have heard of, and if you haven't and it's the first time, it's a really good one to, to put in your head. 60% of web traffic, 60% of the average web page is images. And that gives us a huge opportunity for optimizing our network. OK, can we change formats? Now, in, in the case of WebP, um, by switching to it, the, uh, the Chrome Web Store saved several trans, uh, terabytes of transfer every day. Now, it may not be uh, that it's going to save you that much transfer. But you can immediately start to uh, realize that, actually, instead of JPEGs, I should be using pings, or pings instead of JPEGs and GIFs, maybe, or even WebP. It depends on the actual image and what you're trying to achieve and so forth. But spend some time figuring out whether you can change formats, whether you can change quality, and that will potentially save you an awful lot of data. The next thing is actually request images at the size you need. Responsive web design has uh, become all the rage, and it's really quite cool. Um, but there is this uh, problem with it, which is that people often request their full-size images, and then they, the user ends up paying a tax, as it were. Okay, we rely on client-side uh, client resizing uh, to get it down, but we end up requesting a much larger file in some cases than we actually need. There are loads of things that you can do on the server side to actually let you scale down and cache a smaller version of the image. So if you're not doing that, take a look at that one. And then the last thing is, do you even need an image? Ooh, controversial. You could get away with SVG in some cases. You could get away with fonts, web fonts, with icon glyphs. So take some time to just have a look at those and just play around, see if you can actually uh, get rid of some of your images. 60% of the average page is going to be images. So if we can get rid of that, that saves us a ton. So one of the solutions available to you, if you have control over your server itself, so over the Apache or Nginx installation, is that you can look into using Mud PageSpeed. Mud PageSpeed is an, a plugin made by Google, which basically gives you a free pass to a quicker website. What it does, it looks at your web page before sending it to the user. And it will look into ways to optimize your page by, by inlining resources, by concatenating style sheet files together, and by doing a number of optimization steps, which just generally make it faster. Of course, this does require you to, to be in control of your web page, uh, of your web server, I'm sorry. So, but if you're not, there's another tool available called PageSpeed Insights. Many of you will work on the front end of a website, and this, this tool is as simple as enter the URL of your page, click on a button, and it will start downloading your page, it will start analyzing it, and it will show up with a number of suggestions on how you can optimize the page itself and make it faster to load and to display to the user. Now, of course, these two tools will only, do, uh, will only optimize your page to the best of their abilities. But they do this by looking at the efforts page, what they're doing, and applying these rules over your site. Now, your websites are not efforts. They're special. Because in a way, there is no efforts website. And the only real way to optimize the page itself is by doing it yourself and by looking at what pieces of uh, information or resources on your page actually impact the reduced performance. 
Now, we've already spoken a little bit about DevTools, which make it possible for you to, to look at exactly which parts are taking a long time in the loading process of that web page. But another API available to you is the Resource Timing API, which exposes high fidelity information about most of the resources which you've included on the page itself and gives you insight in how long it took to actually um, look up the DNS for that resource, to connect to the server, or to download the resource. And especially if you have blocking resources such as scripts, it can be a great way to actually figure out which script is blocking your page from showing up quickly. Okay, so we've talked about the kind of things that you can get into for actually transferring your sites and apps down to end users. Now we actually step into the, the runtimey bit. It's actually, it's, it's actually running. And this is the bit where we talk about compute. So we've got everything downloaded or we've got enough to get going. And now we want to talk about what that actually involves to solve for compute. So the first thing we need to do is define this term jank. Now you've probably heard it over the course of the last few days. Let's uh, define it again just in case. Chrome is synchronized to the refresh rate of the device. And that's 60 hertz. That means you've got just about 16 and a half milliseconds to get everything done. And that includes Chrome's housekeeping, it includes your code, and that's a bunch of things like layout, recalc style, paint, composite, JavaScript, all that stuff, 16 milliseconds. I don't get much done in 16 milliseconds, but Chrome really, really does. We call this the frame budget. And if we don't hit that frame budget, users notice. It's kind of this hitching. It, you know, when they scroll and it hitches and hiccups, that's what we call jank. So when we talk about jank in the coming slides, that's what we're referring to. We're talking about busting that frame budget of most likely 16 and a half milliseconds. So the first thing I want to talk about in the compute area is style recalculations. Now, it's very common when we do um, apps that we change as a class on the body. OK? And you do that for maybe state, or you maybe even do it for styling. The problem is, the size of the tree that's affected can be huge. And you see on the left-hand side, hopefully you can see, um, I was changing a class on the body, and I was affecting nearly 20, or just over 23,000 elements by doing that. The recalculation style effort then was 20 milliseconds. Now, this is Canary that's telling us the elements affected. So if you haven't seen that feature, it's a really useful thing when you're trying to figure out kind of what was the impact. There's a corresponding one for layout as well, which tells you uh, the scope and the size of the layout calculation. So we've changed the body, 23,000 uh, elements, 20 milliseconds. I knew that I actually wanted to affect six. And when I did that, it was a fraction of a millisecond. Now, it sounds obvious, but only change the things that you need to change. Go and have a look at your app, see whether uh, you're actually overdoing your style recalculations. Layout thrashing. Um, if you've not seen this one before, this is quite a fascinating one, really. So this little bit of JavaScript at the top um, allows us to get the target, a uh, thing called target from the DOM. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through a bunch of other elements, and we're going to ask, we're going to set their width to match the target's width. Pretty trivial stuff to do. What is that, three lines of code plus a comment? OK. The first thing we need to notice is that asking for offset width is going to cause Chrome to do a layout. So it goes off and it says, all right, what's the left, the top, the width, the height? What do I need to know about all the elements in the page to be able to give you a good answer on offset width? So it goes off and it does that. The next thing is that first element gets its style width uh, value set to the, 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 the target's width. The problem is, by doing that, we just invalidated the layout calculation that we've just done. So that the next time around the loop, we ask Chrome to do a potentially very expensive layout again. So we're doing this get, set, get, set, get, set, get, set, get, set. And the problem is this adds up really quickly, especially when layout is expensive. What we should be doing is getting once and setting many. And it probably makes sense when you hear it in that sense. The thing is to realize that offset width is actually going to cause the layout to happen. And you can, you can Google that, how to not trigger a layout in WebKit. And you'll see uh, a, a very good blog post that will tell you um, which ones in uh, WebKit and Blink will cause um, a layout to happen. So avoid layout thrashing. Two very simple things there, layout and style calculations. So a browser has a very particular set of skills, skills it has acquired over a short but quite eventful career. 
you should not do in JavaScript in an imperative way what you can do in a declarative way. Animations and transitions are excellent examples of that. Five years ago, six years ago, perhaps even more, we had all these libraries such as jQuery or Dojo which had um, animation libraries. And it allows you to animate items on your page. It allows you to change the left property from, from zero to a thousand and move an element horizontally over your page without the user having to do anything at all. And that's awesome. But at, this is really costly because every, every time the frame does something, and often um, a library internally sets a timer to try and match the frame budget of the browser, it, it needs to look at the position, it needs to do a relayout, and all of these are really expensive operations. Now, there are excellent alternatives available to this in CSS to do it in a declarative way. And by using a declarative way, you're actually say, telling the browser what you want it to do instead of telling the browser what it has to do. And by, by telling the browser your goal, you're basically saying, OK, I want you to do this effect, but please do it in the best way you can do it for me. And by using uh, the CSS um, transitions module, module or the CSS animation module, the browser is actually able to optimize all this JavaScript code away from you. It can do these animations in some cases on a different thread. And this will look a lot better and a lot, a lot less janky for the user while also taking a lot less CPU. Um, and can, well, it doesn't eat away from your frame budget. And it works regardless of many of the constraints of the device. Up until a few years ago, fixed position was unreliable. It, it kind of could stick around in, in the viewport. It could be janky if you were scrolling. Now, lately, in pretty much all big mobile browsers, this has been fixed. And of course, it works in all desktop browsers as well. So if you have an element which should always be available in the viewport of the page itself, just use position ficky, uh, sticky, no, position fixed. And, and don't use JavaScript to keep it in exactly that position um, using the scrolling position, for example. But you could use position sticky. What would you use position sticky for? Well, position sticky actually is a new experimental feature in really? Chrome. Yeah. You, you can go to the Chrome Flex page. You can enable it in Chrome for Android as well. And position sticky is somewhat like a fixed position element. But if the parent element is not inside of the viewport itself, so if it's scrolled away somewhere, then it will just be an inflow element. If the parent element comes in the page, then it will make sure that the element is, the sticky position element is visible. Um, but if the parent, the parent element kind of moves out of uh, the viewport, but still is visible, then the element will stick around in the viewport as if it was fixed positioned. Mm -hmm. And an example you might know which uses this quite a lot is an, a an address book. If you have a lot of names, then the header, which contains the first letter of the names which are currently being displayed, may stick around at the top of the viewport for a little while until the next letter is up. And the, the fourth big point is keep your event listener code to a minimum. Some event handlers, such as scrolling events, will be called many, many, many times per second, sometimes even multiple times per frame. And any processing you do in these, um, in these handlers will eat away from your frame budget. And this will, this will definitely limit the time Chrome has to display your web page. And you, as a result, you might miss frames. What, one thing you can definitely do with that one is say you're doing something in your scroll handler, just get it to store the last known value, OK? and then schedule up a request animation frame. Because what will happen is, most of the time, you have like four or five of these running. OK, you get like four or five in a frame, but you actually only care about the last one. So you just store the value, and then set a request animation frame to actually deal with the last known value. This is called debouncing in some places, or yeah, debouncing is the most common name for it. You just basically, rather than running that expensive code in your scroll handler, just keep the value and run one handler at the end. OK, so we've talked about network. We've talked about compute. So let's now take a look at some of the stuff that happens inside of Render. Now, I have DevTools open here. And it's captured something which is quite expensive on the paint side of things. And if you look, we've twizzled down one of the paint records. And we spent 13 milliseconds decoding a JPEG. Now, we have 16 milliseconds to do everything, not just paint. And then we spent a further 71 milliseconds dealing with the resize. Now, this is what I was talking about before about um, responsive web design, is that there's potentially a second tax 
And before we talked about reducing image overhead, but we talked about it from the network constraint. We also have a render constraint because we actually have to process these images. So actually, just getting the, the smallest possible image and in the correct dimensions is actually extremely advantageous. So check out DevTools if you've not seen that feature. That's really useful to actually find out your, your decodes and your resizes. Paint costs. So whenever you scroll or you're interacting with your page, uh, the, the things that change or the things that appear on screen, they need to get painted. And since painting is actually quite an expensive thing, depending on the styles that you apply, we have to keep it to a minimum. So there are two things that are actually involved in reducing paint cost. The first of this, first of which is actually reducing the size of the area that got painted. So you can see I've got uh, show paint rectangles switched on here. So you go into DevTools, hit the cog, switch on show paint rectangles, and then interact with your page. Now, as I roll over these elements, you can see that they, they're flashing red, which is Chrome saying, I paint, repainted those. But watch there. When I scrolled, the whole page flashed red. Now, that should be a warning to you that, that the entire page needed painting. And that's potentially an expensive thing. And it's the kind of thing that gives you those big green bars. OK, now, there is a very specific reason uh, for this one. Um, but I'll let you figure out what that is. Um, the thing to know is that you're looking for those, those smaller areas. The, the question you should be asking yourself is, am I seeing the bits that are getting repainted that I thought were going to get repainted? Is it predictable to me? As in, I rolled over this, and I expected it to repaint. Yes, it did. When I scrolled, I didn't expect to see the whole thing flash red, the whole screen flash red. So there's something to look at there. The second thing, once we've reduced the, the size of the paint areas, is to then reduce the complexity of the paint areas. So we got this other tool that's fantastic. It's called, um, called Continuous Page Repainting. And what it does is it puts Chrome into a mode where it forces Chrome to repaint the whole page every frame. Okay, you see it switched on there. It puts this little uh, chart in the top right-hand corner with the, the number of milliseconds that it took to paint the page. Now, what we can do is we start switching off styles. And in this particular case, switching off box shadow uh, or border radius is the one that's actually dropping that time to paint really far down. Now, I'd much rather you didn't walk out of here saying, box shadow is bad, border radius is bad. We shan't choose these. That's not what we want you to do. What we want you to do is realize that, that your styles have a corresponding cost, and there is a tool in DevTools that will let you figure what the cost is. And you can use that to your advantage to, to move away from that constraint so that you're not render bound. OK, so reduce the paint size, then reduce the complexity of your paints. So far, we've talked about technical constraints which apply to you as the developer. But eventually, what we really want is to give the right user experience to the end user, to the person who's actually using your page. Now, one thing to realize is that the user comes for your content. They come to your website with a specific person, uh, purpose that could be to get information, that could be to use your service. And they don't really care about that, that big image header, which you had to have at all of the top of your pages, which basically just means that they have to scroll the page before they even get to the content. You, as the developer, have all these constraints. But the user shouldn't have them. And the, the main thing here, uh, the main takeaway, is that if I, as a user, use my mobile device, if I use a phone to look at your website, I really don't care about how well it works on a, web, on a desktop machine because I use a mobile device. And the other way around, the same goes. And while you probably want to offer um, the same, a, a different user experience, because after all, there are different classes of devices, you should offer the same functionality. And what this basically means is that the content on your page or the services, it's fine to refactor them or to reshape them in a way that's more optimized for the device as long as you don't offer that reduced functionality, such as a simple entry page. Sorry, you can't, use a, you can't use the TV guide at this time because it's not optimized for mobile. Please use a desktop. Because that just scares away users. When you develop a website for a desktop computer, you've got all the screen estate available to you. You can put content next to each other. You can put it on top of each other in any format you want, for, especially for text. You can have a news article, you can have a bold introduction, you can have related information about the company or the people who are mentioned in the article itself. And this is nice, because on a desktop, because there's all this space, even relatively big amount of text look, look quite moderate, and it doesn't fill up your screen. 
Now, for mobile devices, this is a problem. Or actually, for devices with constrained screen size, this is a problem. Because if I look at exactly the same text, or maybe even one paragraph of text on my mobile phone, then my entire screen is filled with text. And that's quite intimidating. If I then start to scroll down, and I get five or six more paragraphs, then I have to scroll for several seconds before the text stops, even at relatively high scroll speeds. And this is intimidating, and this could easily scare away users. Now, we know that you're not always in control of your content, so changing the text itself or changing the images might not always be a feasible solution, but you can at least pass on the message that, that the users care a lot more about getting an optimized experience and care about getting the same functionality than they get for getting all of the text and all of the site information. And one thing to notice here, just if we go back, is at the, the bottom of uh, that, that, we've got an image that's kind of suggesting something like responsive. Just bear in mind, if you do do this kind of responsive thing, just watch out for that tax that I talked about earlier about resizing images down. Make sure you always request the images at the right size. OK. So we have a couple of suggestions, as you've just seen, um, because we think um, it would be good to give you a couple of, uh, couple of suggestions for your workflow. Uh, the first one is assign somebody that you used to like uh, to your team as the sheriff. Uh, they will probably become unpopular pretty quickly. However, they, uh, they perform a very important role for you. Um, as you can see, the idea is to, to clarify and set some constraints before you start. How much time are we going to spend in garbage collection, paint, composite, layout, recalc style? Where are we going to spend our time? On the assumption that we've got a network-constrained device or, or a render-constrained device. Where are we going to actually spend our time? Then that person is going to track it, and they're going to stop you from shipping if you don't hit it. Now, the, the question then becomes, well, what number should we have? And the honest answer is it depends on your application. But have that person. A lot of times um, when we speak to developers, um, performance and this, uh, this kind of stuff is often um, a bit like a unit test. Are we fast? No. Whoops. Um, <laughs> what we're talking about is building it in from the start so that it's, it's something that you're continually ch checking all the way through. And there's somebody who's owning and is responsible for that for you as a team. Check out jankfree.org. That's a bunch of uh, slides. Uh, it's a bunch of articles. It's a bunch of videos, uh, all of which are designed to help you with these, the things that we've talked about and in a lot more detail than uh, we've been able to cover. So that's a fantastic resource that you can uh, track. So should we conclude? We should, because yeah. it says conclusion on the screen. Yes. Super. It's not about the device which users are able to access your websites. It's about the content and the experience which you're delivering to them. And while the content and the functionality should be the same, you can optimize them to create a user experience specific to the different devices. The devices you're going to deal with, they're going to probably have at least one constraint at some point. You might, not, you might even on a desktop, you might have multiple processes running. There's no guarantee that you're going to be good. So you figure out ways to actually just reduce the load. Fight against those constraints, and you will be agnostic. And mostly, let the browser do what it's good at doing. If you're doing stuff with JavaScript and you don't need to do it, don't do it. Let the browser do it for you. And just to reiterate on that content a little bit more, users come to your page for content. I've said it a number of times, and I just say it again. Can refactor your content in a more direct and concise way to, to get it to them in the fastest way possible. Because after all, that's why they're there. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, we have a tiny amount of time for, for one or two questions, maybe. So if you have a question, go up to the mic. And we'll see if we can get through any of them. And then if you want to find us after, we're going to be uh, upstairs in the Chrome area, probably in the for questions. I'll be at the for, for performance bit if you're interested. I'm curious, the last couple IOs, we've seen a lot about getting rid of jank and using the debouncing technique that you guys have talked about to do so, yep. which strikes me as a bug in the spec, because I don't know why anyone would ever care about getting 200 uh, touch or scroll events per frame, and yet every single application that any developer here is going to write means that we have to take all this data, persist it somewhere, use it in yet another function and let it be garbage collected later. Is that something that we should address at a lower level than our, the JavaScript that we write? 
Well, I think if that's how you feel, definitely involve yourself in the spec process, uh, for sure. Um, it's, it's something that we, we're trying to watch, and I'm interested in it. Um, because especially, as I said, I see a lot of code go into scroll handlers and touch handlers that doesn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a certain amount of, should this be spec? Should this be developer required? I, I haven't got a good use case for multiple scroll handler um, or multiple calls of a scroll handler, for example, inside a single frame. But I wouldn't like to presume that nobody does. But I'm not saying that they do either. So I guess it could be something that should be spec'd. Um, and I would involve yourself in the spec process and see if we can hash it out. Well, a lot of specifications already keep this in mind by offering asynchronous functionality rather than synchronous ones. And even though this is often not the case for event handlers yet, for, for getting many kinds of data, it will, it will allow it to do on the background thread, not block, the, not block any other processing, and just come back when everything is available. Okay. Um, we've gone a little bit over time. Yeah, so uh, I'm afraid if you've got any questions, just come and find us uh, upstairs. Thank, Thank you. you.